Promotional consideration paid for by the following. Hi there, I'm Vacant, the man who's held more world championships than Ric Flair and John Cena combined. And I'm here to tell you about this cool new mobile game. <laughs> Never mind what he said, folks. I'm Vacant, and I'm here to talk to you about crypto. Wait a minute, wait a minute. What did you say your name was again? I'm Vacant. No, you're not. I am. You don't even sound like me. Now that's just ridiculous. I too am Vacant, the most decorated world champion of all time. Oh yeah? How many ECW championships have you won then? Oh, I uh, Break time. Ha! Wrong! The ECW title was only vacated once by Bobby Lashley in 2007. That long ago, huh? Boy, that guy sure found the fountain of youth, didn't he? I know, right? I think he was put in too big a position when he started out younger and... But wait a minute! Don't change the subject! You stole my identity and I'm taking it back! <laughs> identity theft can be a hassle. That's why you need Surfshark VPN. Surfshark encrypts your personal data so nobody can track or steal it. Get safe, secure internet access from anywhere in the world. Jump to one of thousands of global servers and unlock streaming content on sites like Netflix you can't get at home. Surfshark has tons of uses and covers an unlimited number of devices. Want to learn more? Support the channel by downloading Surfshark with the link in the description. Use the code REGRET to get 83% off, plus three extra months of service and their antivirus program for free. Well, I can't believe this. It was my younger brother abeyance this whole time. That was for burning down our parents' funeral home when we were kids. Hey, let's do it for the content. Mega Ray. Let's go. Let's get it. Kick, kick city. It gets gritty when Mega Ray come through. The kid gets busy. Work yourself into a shoot, but you know it's legit. Like what you like, just don't be a dick. Hey, that's the wet regret. Let's get it. What's that set? Maybe you should bottle it. Drink it and spray it on, get clawed to model it. Eight years in, can't look back. Who else can make the lost sweatsuits look whack? Constant with regret. Let's get it. Yeah! When I began watching wrestling in 98, something that captured my excitement more than anything was any time a wrestler would jump from one company to the other and make a big splash. I really enjoyed the spontaneous feel of it. With a couple of exceptions, the moves were all surprises, like a run-in or a shocking debut promo. For a while, it felt like these kind of moments happened on a weekly basis. It was a big part of what made wrestling so fun to watch back then. But while the WWF and WCW were going back and forth for rating supremacy, behind them was ECW, the third of the big three. Though they lacked the budget of the bigger companies, the talent pool was deep and competitive throughout the mid to late 1990s. And that meant from time to time, these extreme stars would venture out to the bigger pastures of New York and Atlanta. Some of those who left ECW would go on to become Hall of Famers, guys like Mick Foley, Rob Van Dam, the Dudleys, and so on. Some carved out great and lengthy careers for themselves, like Lance Storm, Stevie Richards, and Raven. Then there was everyone else. This week, we're honoring that specific few, the ECW wrestlers who jumped ship to other companies during the Monday Night War, but discovered that the grass wasn't always greener on the other side. For whatever reason, these folks never lasted long or did nearly as well as they had in the extreme promotion, which sometimes even led to them going back to the company they left in the first place. Because we're focusing on the specific timeline of the Monday Night Wars, that means I won't be talking about wrestlers who left ECW after the company folded. That means no Dreamer, no Rhino, no Just Incredible, no Jerry Lynn. Though I do want to honorably mention Kid Cash and Easy Money, the latter known in WCW as Jason Jett. The two of them fled to WCW after ECW shut down in February of 01, probably unaware that their new home was on its way to Shutdownsville. But at least Jett got to work the final WCW pay-per-view. Cash only made his debut on the last episode of Thunder. Hello and goodbye. I've already talked about Taz and Mike Awesome in separate full-length videos on this channel, so I won't be going into too much detail about them here. Both men came into their respective companies under big memorable circumstances. Taz debuting at Madison Square Garden, Awesome jumping ship while ECW champion. And while they were certainly reliable hands through the rest of the Monday Night War, and while one of them is obviously still relevant to this day, it's safe to say their runs during that specific time period weren't as good as what they had before. And in in case anyone asks, I won't talk about Al Snow in this video either. Not out of spite for the Ultimate Deathmatch movies or anything, but I wouldn't consider him an ECW original in the same way I would, say, Mikey Whipwreck or Public Enemy. Snow's big run there came when he was on loan from the World Wrestling Federation, part of a talent exchange between it and ECW. That was where he took on a schizophrenic gimmick and introduced the uber-popular head, which he then took back to the WWF. It's the backstory a lot of newer fans like myself really knew him for, but doesn't exactly make him an ECW guy. And with those caveats out of the way, let's begin! 
Um, let's begin. Let's let's turn down the music for this part, okay? Can we? Um, hello. If you want to talk about wrestlers who are made for this category, it has to be Shane Douglas. He became one of the first to reinvent himself in ECW after failed runs in both the WWF and WCW. His time in Atlanta and the resentment he felt after working there was the catalyst for his evolution into the franchise of ECW. In a move that kickstarted Extreme Championship Wrestling's new direction, Douglas infamously threw down the NWA world title after winning it in August of 94. Though he railed against the big promotions, he wasn't above taking big promotion money when he came Came back to the WWF in the summer of 95 as Dean Douglas. In the era of occupational gimmicks, Dean's real life experience as a school teacher led to this incredibly corny character who cut promos in front of a chalkboard and graded the performances of other wrestlers. Hmm, <laughs> everyone knows that job's for folks like me. Eventually, Dean crossed paths with Razor Ramon, who is considered to be the gateway to the main event. Have a good match with him, you were golden. If not, it's Sparky Plug territory for you. Razor was allegedly unimpressed with Douglas' performance, which led to he and the clique burying Shane to management. Douglas did get to hold the Intercontinental Championship previously held by Shawn Michaels for all of 20 minutes before he lost it to Ramon that same night. Butting heads with Vince regarding push, pay, and injuries led to Douglas' departure from the company in early 96 and his swift return to ECW. His second run there was even bigger than his first, as he'd go on to win the television and world titles two more times each. But by mid-1999, disagreements with Paul Heyman, like for example over when Shane had to max out his credit cards to help pay for the company's travel expenses, <laughs> you know, the huge, led to Douglas leaving the company yet again, this time for WCW. As opposed to how he was portrayed in the Federation, Shane more or less got to stay the same person when he jumped to Atlanta, immediately forming the revolution with Chris Benoit, Dean Malenko, Perry Saturn, and Perry's cool hat. But upon Vince Russo's arrival to the company, Benoit was pulled from the group and turned face, which spelled the beginning of the end for the team. While Douglas certainly had the mic skills to carry them, injuries had been mounting and slowed him down considerably. Then Saturn and Malenko jumped the WWF with Benoit and Eddie Guerrero, leaving Douglas to go on hiatus for several months. The franchise came back to be part of the New Blood storyline, pairing up with Tori Wilson in a series of infamous matches with Billy Kidman. Paul Heyman only wishes he could have booked the Viagra on a pole match. Perhaps Shane's greatest highlight during this time was beating General Hugh G. Rection, not in the aforementioned pole match, which would have made sense, but rather a normal contest to win the US Championship, only to drop it to Rick Steiner weeks later. He sat out the remainder of his contract until WCW was bought by the WWF in March. And based on their history, I'm just gonna assume the phone did not ring for Shane for that invasion angle. Thanks to his WCW run, Shane probably fared better than everyone else on this list in terms of being pushed on a national scale. But after being pushed so hard on ECW as their equivalent to Triple H, or is it the other way around, everything after that felt like chump change. Chronic injuries and a lot of burned bridges ultimately kept Shane from finding an identity beyond the man who helped bring ECW to the forefront as their top heel. Good thing he's got his acting career to fall back on. Jobbers die. Not many ventures. <laughs> Speaking of death, nobody in wrestling was more death-defying than Sabu. Perhaps no other wrestler was more responsible for establishing ECW's early rep with his human highlight reel antics. There are only a handful of wrestlers you can point to as the most influential to our current generation, and Boo easily belongs in that group. In September of 95, Sabu was in the off portion of his off-again, on-again relationship with Paul Heyman and accepted Eric Bischoff's offer to join WCW. Did Bischoff really want one of wrestling's hottest underground stars or did he just want to stick it to ECW? It had to be the latter of the two because what did Easy e expect from Sabu in WCW? As has been recalled countless times over the years, Turner's standards and practices were notoriously strict on what could and couldn't be done on WCW TV. And let's just say most of Sabu's standard spots belonged in the couldn't category. Take the barbed wire, chairs, and blood out of Sabu's repertoire, and it feels like Evil Knievel going 8 miles an hour on a go-kart track. Give credit to WCW, they did allow Sabu to implement his tried and true parlor trick of putting people through tables, which he did for most of his run, a total of four on-camera appearances across two months. The biggest moment of this run came at Halloween Havoc 95, when he beat Mr. JL in a spot-tastic match that barely went more than three minutes long. And since the show took place in Detroit, he was accompanied to the ring by his uncle, the original Sheik, who decided to punctuate the victory with an unplanned fireball to the face. One more match the next night on Nitro, and that was it for Sabu before his WCW career went up in flames. You know what Sabu's problem there was? His pants weren't nearly baggy enough. He could have changed gimmicks and fit right in with our next entry. You 
yes, yes, y'all. Yes, yes, y'all. Yes, 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 y'all. Embodying the rise of hip hop and white suburbia in the early 90s, Public Enemy was a perfect gimmick for its time and place. At their peak, Rocco Rock and Johnny Grunge were so popular that a small bidding war for them took place between the WWF and WCW in 1996. They went with the security of WCW, which would end up costing them politically in a major way later in the story. As outlandish as Public Enemy were in ECW, it's kind of incredible that their run in WCW ended up being so unremarkable. They did have a wild feud with the Nasty Boys and even spent eight precious days as tag team champions, but most of their run was just a blur of breaking tables and waving arms before leaving in the fall of 98. After a brief return to ECW, they debuted with the Federation in early 1999 with big hopes, big dreams, and a big target on their back. Not only did the company remember the snub of 96, our boys were also unlucky enough to receive the Terry Taylor seal of approval. That was a kiss of death in some circles, as the new agent and recent WCW defector in his own right didn't have the best reputation backstage in the Federation. They just... Wow, they really hated the rooster gimmick, you know? Flyboy Rocco and Grunge did themselves no favors by trying to change the finish of a match with the APA that March. Though it may have seemed selfless of them to ask that they themselves be put through tables, Bradshaw and Farouk made it abundantly clear they didn't have time for that shit. Public Enemy spent four minutes getting the shit shot out of them, and that was pretty much their biggest highlight in their whole two or three month run. Well, that and a really fucked up moment that I feel nobody talks about. Somebody help! That's Flyboy Rocco from Public Enemy. P.E.'s short run was so bad, the Dudley Boys WWF tenure began later that year on ridiculously thin ice simply by association. But unlike Public Enemy, Bubba and Devon managed to pass the APA test, and the rest is history. The guys soon came back to familiar territory in WCW for a whole two weeks on a per-appearance deal. The peak of this run came at Bash the Beach 99 when they took part in the Junkyard Invitational, a hardcore match in an actual junkyard. It was hard to watch, not just in the literal sense on account of it being terribly lit or that you could hardly tell who was who, but that the match resulted in numerous legitimate injuries to the wrestlers since nothing was gimmicked or planned out with the performer's health in mind. Whew, that junkyard match was hard to get through. Let's change gears to something a little more palatable. <coughs> more junkyard invitational, please! Ah yes, time to talk about my one-time Vegas panel mate, the Blue Meanie. One of the perennial favorites of ECW fans over the years, the founding member of the BWO debut for the WWF shortly after Survivor Series 98. He got his start as a member of the Job Squad, one of my guilty pleasures of my early fandom. Though in hindsight, it's insane that Too Cold Scorpio was ever part of the Job Squad. Oh right, I forgot that Scorpio belongs on the list too. Man, they did him dirty there. Like Flash Funk and that whole thing, and they put him in the Job Squad. What were they thinking? He is so good. He's still good today. He did not deserve to be Flash Funk or be in the job squad. Man, it's just not right. It's just not right. <sighs> oh, right, Blue Meanie. Anyway, I became a fan of this guy almost instantly. At 13 years old, I never once questioned why this big guy was wearing Daisy Dukes and had goggles painted on his face. I was so new to everything in wrestling at that time, I would look at him and go, nope, I see nothing wrong with him. He makes total sense. The highlight of his time in the company came in early 99 when he began a feud with Goldust, even trying to match him mind game for mind game. Coleman, stop, stop showing that. The meanie lost to Goldust at St. Valentine's Day Massacre, but soon joined up with him, calling him his mommy and fighting Ryan Shamrock for her, his attention until Goldie eventually dumped them both. Before his release in late 99, the Meanie and fellow ECW alum Stevie Richards paired up together, helping create a piece of forgotten WWE lore, a segment that only aired one time and left a lot of questions in its wake. But if you want to hear about true legend, have you heard a legend of the blonde bitch? Yes, the Blonde Bitch Project. The brainchild of Vince Russo and Ed Ferrara, the Blair Witch parody was meant to be a big diss on Sable, who had recently left the company on poor terms. A single vignette setting up the saga was shown on an episode of Raw, then was never seen or brought up again once Vincent Mann decided that nobody would get the reference, since he himself hadn't seen what was, at one point that year, the number one movie in America. 
Come on, tape traders. If y'all could find that Bret Hart-Tom McGee matchup a few years ago, then surely someone's got the unaired episodes of this bit lying around. We turn our attention now to Mikey Whipwreck. ECW's lovable jobber turned Triple Crown winner left the company in late 98, making his surprise debut at the uncensored pay-per-view to challenge Kidman for the Cruiserweight title. It was a great showing, but apparently it was too good. Their opening contest blew the next match of Stevie Ray and Vincent out of the water, which led to the former Virgil complaining about it to higher-ups. And that was the end of Mikey's upward trajectory in WCW. Mikey wound up on the losing end of all but one of his matches from March till August, rotating between fellow Cruiserweights and other hardcore wrestlers with no real direction. His final WCW appearance was on the August 23rd, 99 episode of Nitro, when Sid Vicious stopped a match between Mike and Chase Tatum as part of his ongoing Path of Destruction. Next time we saw Whipwreck in ECW, he was hanging out with the Sinister Minister. I'm a former World Heavyweight Champion. Shut up! Nothing against Mikey, but WCW had a hard time booking Rey Mysterio right in some cases. What were they going to do with an average looking guy who wrestled in a t-shirt? Keep all the things that made him cool the first time around? Hello, Jim. Hello, Canyon. Oh yeah, of course not. That would be ridiculous. Of all the cups of coffee we talked about in this episode, it's the Sandman's jump to WCW that confuses me most of all. He smoked, he drank, he had an entrance that, as epic as it was, was impossible to recreate in companies that actually gave a shit about not being sued. I could see the character doing okay in the Federation during the Monday Night War, but clean cut down home WCW? Sandy left ECW in late 98, but didn't actually debut for WCW until early 99, picking up weekly checks for doing nothing all the while in the meantime. Finally, the Singapore cane swinging freak began appearing in TV in January, playing Raven's preppy neighbor, Jim. Grandma, oh, you haven't aged a day since the first time I met you. EC dub, EC dub, EC dub. But that idea was scrapped, and he soon showed back up as a somewhat toned down version of his ECW character. No more drinking or smoking, but the barbed wire around his body could stay. Now known by his nickname of Hack, since ECW owned the trademark to the more famous name, the man was a cornerstone of WCW's new hardcore division. The company's attempt to blatantly copy, I mean lovingly rip off the hardcore stylings of the WWF and ECW, minus all the blood. Good luck with that. Unsurprisingly, Hack did pretty well in this environment, working alongside guys like Bam Bam Bigelow and Brian Knob to help bolster the fledgling division. They tried an angle with him at one point, which multiple people had to stop Hack from smoking his damn cigarette in peace, even having Eric Bischoff slap him in the face. You gotta put something in your mouth. Make a stick of chewing gum. Predictably, nothing came of that, then it was time for the aforementioned and heavily cursed Junkyard Invitational. Apparently, Hack was scheduled to win the match until he showed up to the production meeting late and, by his own admission, not entirely sober, so Finley got the nod instead. All Sandman got was a separated shoulder, an injured neck, and a pink slip while he was recovering from those first two things. The Sandman returned to ECW in October of 99 with his proverbial kendo stick between his legs, where he remained until the company folded. He would win the company's world title for a record fifth time at ECW's final pay-per-view before losing it to Rhino only minutes later. And on that note, we conclude our journey looking at ECW's least inspiring defections. These guys were no McFoley's or Rob Van Dam's or Dudley Boys, but they hold a special place in my heart nonetheless. I'm really glad I finally got to do this video because I've spent my entire wrestling fandom questioning how hires like this even went down. For some fans, griping that wrestlers aren't being used correctly in a new workplace is nothing new, but man oh man were they justified in their anger with these guys. But I suppose in the end, the legacies of these workers will always remain in the land of extreme. Wonky booking and or lousy reps outside that world be damned. They may not have been used to the best of their abilities outside of ECW, but the fact that I've spent the last 21 years just dying to talk about them proves they still made a lasting impact. What were some of your favorite moments of ECW wrestlers showing up in other companies? Did I miss anyone in particular? Let me know in the comment section below. I'm Brian Zane, and I'll see you next time. A lot of guys call themselves hardcore. You see him coming out to the ring with Barb Ryan wrapped around them. Well, he's in the fencing business. I was the first man to take down these ropes and put up Barb Wire and have a match in between them. I was the first man to wrap barbed wire around a baseball bat. <laughs>